I didn't have in the notes the wget for today's lecture17.org. Oh. I apparently didn't paste in the URL. <coughs> there it is if you wanted it. Well, just to make it different for you guys, we're going to switch it up today from our Python stuff and uh, try and make it a little bit different. We're, we're going to do some graphical stuff, and we're going to go back to the shell, and we're going to leave Python out of class today for a little bit. Hopefully make some pictures. So for those of you that know, we're going to make you very excited about the topic today, and we're going to tell you what a chart is. What, what is a chart? The chart is a piece of paper that you navigate off of. Okay, we're done today. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and get started for today. We're going to go over QGIS, which is a graphical GIS, geographic information system type piece of software. And we're going to also use a tool called, and this is where it's tough about um, pronunciation, it's G-D-A-L. And some people say Goodle, and some people say GDAL, and some people just say the letters. So today it's QGIS or Quantum GIS, and I call it GDAL. Now, just a reminder, in homework two, where you submitted your org note file, I think it was two, I'd like you today to submit your org log file today, put it on the server, and send email me the MD5 sum of your log file. And I believe this is homework four, so you'll just create a homework slash zero for directory and put it in there. And just send me the MD5 sum. I know a bunch of you have already done that because I know you're in the middle of midterms. So I'll remind you again at the end of class if I can remember. But just try and do that by tonight, by midnight. If you, or if you want to do it before 5 a.m., I'll let you go to 5 a.m. if you really feel like it, just for fun. Okay, so let's talk about nautical charts. We're going to use them as our sample data set today for two reasons. One is we need a sample data set to play with the tools that we're going to be learning. And two, understanding chart formats is kind of important because you'll be probably wanting to bring them in throughout your work as background data, even if you're not navigating or doing anything, or you may even be working on a particular chart trying to update it. So let's talk about the types of charts that we've got. And right now in the world, there's sort of, sort of three types of charts. And they come in, uh, we'll draw a little hierarchy for you. So there's RNC and ENC. This is raster nautical charts. This is a picture that's drawn off by a cartographer as an actual image. This is the paper chart in electronic form. And this is the ENC or electronic navigation chart. And electronic. And in the US, now there may be other formats elsewhere in the world, but typically the standard is over here with RNCs, you have a format called BSB that is an image format into and of itself that's not really used for anything else. And over here we have two formats. One is called S57, and the other one is coming slowly but surely through the standards bodies, and it'll arrive here some decade. And that's uh, S100. And these are, I, I think it's IHO standards for charts. This one is it's an IEC standard. We'll see the text for it, and you'll see the format a little bit. It comes from something that the spatial data transform, SDTS, the format is really not terribly fun. This one is going to be based on XML. While XML can be really awesome and helpful, it can also be a big mess. Hopefully, the standards group will work really hard and make a very nice, clean design here, but we have yet to fully see what's coming out of that. And so these are the two formats that we're going to deal with today is S57 and BSBs. And then we're also, if we have time, going to try and play with bathymetric attributed grids or bags. Unfortunately, the version of Linux we have contains a GDAL that's too old to read bags. So I'm hoping that in the next couple classes on the side, I can create a new package for GDAL that we can install that will actually read bags. Because right now we can't actually read those, which is a big bummer because this is some gridded data from hydrographic surveys that's really cool that I'd like you guys to take a peek at later on in the class. So we're definitely going to look at bags through GDAL later. Today we're just going to do them just to, to see a quick bag and get a, a start on that if we have time. So let's start off with the electronic charts. Before I jump into that, the BSB format is a cautionary warning. Some of you later on in your careers may end up on standards committees and be deciding the format of things. Please don't pick a format owned by a company. If you do that, you're going to get yourself in a world of pain 
NOAA and the other hydrographic offices have managed to pull out a fast one. It's now okay to use BSBs, but there was a few years when everyone said, I refuse to write tools for this format, and it got very unfun. So try to stick with open standards when you work on things, because it's very hard to build reliable software and not get yourself sued in the process uh, when you're using formats that are confused and closed. Let's take a peek at the NOAA website. And I'll give you some opinions today that are just my opinions. They are not NOAA's or CECOM's or UNH's opinions about nautical charts and how you can or can't use them. The NOAA website, if you search for ENCs, will take you to this. And you're going to see a lot of R's for registered trademarks and a lot of warnings about stuff. In the notes, you'll be able to click straight through to this. But if we click on the download NOAA ENCs, we get lots and lots of legal ease and it's not clear that somewhere in the middle there's an actually a click button to actually go to the data it's kind of hiding in there so i've got links that'll get us right to it there's a whole idea of what's permitted use and if you're on a ship if you're under solace regulations imo regulations iho the u.s coast guard stuff like that you may have to follow specific rules but if you're in here working with the data this is u.s government data and we can use and abuse it as we see fit if we're trying to drive a ship and you need a carriage requirement for a chart, you have to get the data directly from NOAA or an approved person. And there aren't any really good checks in that process. I'll talk a little bit about that as we go down away with MD5 sums and things like that where you could actually validate the data. There aren't any validations in their process and it's a little hard to follow. In this class, we can use this data however we like. So if you wanna rip out part of it and use it in one of your projects with US government data, go for it. So you're all on US soil so we can we can have fun with this chart data. So they have lots of, I've copied some of the uh, entertaining text in here about copying and displaying ENCs and we can pretty much say whatever. So if you click the, the proceed to chart downloader, we've now gotten a little bit closer to our charts but not there yet. So there's a click here to download our electronic navigation charts. Not there yet. In here, I thought it'd be fun to work with the charts for our local area because you're gonna be doing projects for summer hydro probably and possibly a master's or PhD thesis in this area and having chart background data in your material and in your store of things you can use is pretty, pretty handy. So there's a nice little link down here for New Hampshire, NH, under ENCs by state. This is kind of nice. These are new features that have only been in there for a couple of years. You can click on New Hampshire and you should get data, but you don't get data. You get another permitted use statement saying that thou shall not be bad and that you uh, accept all of the liability for using this data, which they actually can't enforce any liability on you other than the liability you already have. And way down here at the bottom, this little tiny OK that gives you a link to a JavaScript thingy, that's your data. But the nice part is, if you click that and download it, once you save it, you can always right click in the download window of Firefox, copy download link. You now have the direct URL to that data. And it's okay for you to just give that URL to someone else, uh, which is what I'm doing for you guys. So if you wanna skip all of that stuff, see if I can find it here, you're actually okay to run this wget command and just grab the data and ignore all of those, how many steps is that? Like five or six steps to get towards the data. There's a lot of CYA, it's a great term, cover your, <clears throat> we'll copy that link and let's go ahead and get started in playing with some data. I've gone into, I'm in class 17 and I'm gonna paste in that wget command and we're gonna see if we can cause Noah to think that they're being attacked by CCOM. And go ahead and download that ENC zip file. So we played a lot with TARS and compressed with BZ2 and GZ2 files. Go ahead and use this wget command here to grab that data, or if you were in the web link and you went through all this craziness and followed along, you can do that. Go ahead and grab that data. So I'll be good and I'll paste it in IRC for a change since I remembered. And we're gonna go and learn how to use the zip tools to look inside of a zip. So typically, if you're used to Windows, you probably double click a zip file, WinZip comes up if you've bought it. 
you get this graphical interface and you have to do everything by hand. Here, we're able to script it if we wanted to, but we can then say unzip. Oh, actually, let me back up here. I have a couple of things I wanted to show you. The first one is MD5SUM. This, if, if I were Noah, and I'm not, I would provide with my files an MD5SUM, and there's also another checksum called SHA, and there's a number of different SHA versions. These are government-approved checksum functions that if you calculate them, you can tell that you have the same file as me. And if I were Noah, I would say, in order for you to have good charts on your ship, you better run the checksum on them and make sure your checksum matches what's on the NOAA site, rather than trying to download a file and it might not actually match, or it might be out of date. And they don't have any version numbers on here, so I'm going to get on my little soapbox and say, Dear Noah, it would be really great if you versioned your charts in the delivery files. So now that I've said that, and I feel better, <laughs> we'll do one more checksum, and then we're going to go play with the zip file. So SHA, and I'm going to hit tab, and it shows you the, some of the different SHA algorithms that are around. 256 is a commonly used one. The, these are, this is the number of bits in the checksum that's generated. And the more bits, the better, but the slower it is to compute. So we'll do SHA256 sum, and then the file name, so NH ENC zip. And if you notice here, the MD5 sum was this long. So that's fairly long, but the SHA one is super long. It's getting bigger and bigger. And if you had to read that over a phone to somebody, you'd probably get it wrong. But the idea with the longer number is that with big files, they're doing these calculations about some number to go with the file. The more numbers you have, the less likely they probably are to collide with each other and have the same number. So the thing you really don't want to have is two different files that are really different that end up with the same checksum. And SHA is even better than MD5 in terms of having, not having the chance of these collisions. And we'll see more of that throughout the semester. We'll play with that a little bit with bags and some of the metadata. Let's go ahead and take a look at zip. So I want to remind you guys, since we're back in the shell and we haven't been here too much in a while, you can say man unzip, and that will give you the manual page for the unzip command. If you think you can't fall asleep and you need some reading, here you go. This will put you to sleep. There's lots of useful information, but what you often really want is the unzip dash dash help. It's probably more along the lines of something that you're going to want. And this is usually, for most commands, it'll give you a quick summary what we're looking for is list files, and we're also looking for, there's a verbose, a dash V running around, there's a uppercase one, and there's a lowercase one that I'm not seeing. Here it is, list verbosely. So we're gonna say unzip dash L for list, and it's really wise, before you go and unzip something, or untar it, look inside, and make sure there isn't something bizarre and crazy in there. Otherwise, you might spend the next hour trying to pick apart something that got stuck all over your computer with weird characters and whatnot. So we'll do a dash V for verbose and nh underscore ENCs dot zip. So go ahead and type that in and we'll go and do a listing of what's in our zip file. So it's going to tell you the size of a file under length, how it was compressed. Ooh, I'm not sure the difference between length and size. We'll just ignore that. The date that the original file was. So these files are from 1025, so they're pretty recent. And inside of a zip file, they have a, something like the MD5 or the SHA, they have a CRC32. And if you look, there aren't very many numbers in here, so there's a much greater chance of a CRC32 having the same number for two different files. And then it lists off the, all the file names. And the NOAA standard for packaging charts is they always unpack into this ENC root directory for the S57 charts. So it looks looks okay. We'll go ahead and unzip that. So you just say unzip nh underscore ENCs dot zip. Press enter. And you should now have a bunch of files on your disk. So let's take a peek at those. I'm going to show you a couple commands that are new as we go through taking a look. ls-l, we'll see that there should be an ENC root directory. And we're going to go ahead and cd into ENC root. And we'll do an ls-l, so you should see a whole bunch of directories. There's US, stands for United States. Two is a resolution, and I think five are like the really close-up charts. Two and one is like the big regional charts. 
and then it's got a letter code for NH for New Hampshire, and then followed by some chart numbers, and I'm not sure what the M is. Anyone know what the M? Okay, well, we'll look those up sometime, and we'll stick them back in the notes. They're not overly important that we know what those are. Oh, yep, there is a readme, so less readme. I like to read the readme and kick the kick me. So this should hopefully go through something more than just more legalese. And in fact, down at the bottom, they've got a set of chart information about what's in this directory tree. So we'll go ahead and queue for quit if you've forgotten with, that, with less. Let's play with some other Unix commands. There's du for disk usage. So if you just hit du in here. It's going to list probably in either k or half k the number of bytes in each, each of these folders. Remember that we can do an h for a human readable. So then it will tell you 2.6 megabytes, 4.3 megabytes. I'm going to show you a, a fun command called find. What you do with find is you say find space and then the starting directory. And after that, you can tell it, please find me certain kinds of files. But if you don't tell it anything, it'll find you every file under that path. Which, if you do that for like slash on your computer, the top root directory, it's going to list every file on your computer. And it, it might take half an hour. But we're going to do it here inside of the ENC root, which is not that big. So go ahead and try it. And see every single file that's in this directory tree. What it lets you do is you can then pass that to other commands and then they can operate on sets of files. There's a command called file, if you remember from before. So we can say file star, and that'll tell us what types of files we have. And you can see that uh, the user agreement from NOAA is in some not ASCII form, kind of funky. Uh, but what we can do is we can use that find command to pass all the list of all the files to the file command, and then we can ask the file of every single thing in here. So we can, if we didn't know what kind of file types we were going to run into, which is going to be an S57, here's how we would ask. So we'll do file, period. We'll do the vertical bar for the Unix pipe. There's a funky command called xargs, which takes one line out of the input, so each file, and it's going to then pass that to the program that we're going to give it. So this is, looks a little weird, so we'll say xargs file, Press enter and it's going to go zooming by. Find period pipe xargs file. So we want to run this command. Go ahead and hit enter and you should see text go screaming by. It's going to tell you the file type that it thinks for everything that's in here. And unfortunately, when it comes to our charts, it just says this is some sort of data. Not very helpful. I've been trying to work with the authors of file to add in various chart types and things like that, and I haven't quite figured out the best string to give them to identify S57, but we're, we're getting there. Let's go ahead and get all the unique list of file types. So if you remember, so we've got each file listed here, and then a colon, so we can split these up based on the colon. Does anybody remember the command in Unix to split on some character? That would be the Python one. That's good, that's definitely good. Remember split, but if we're not in Python, does anybody remember a Unix command that might split it apart based on a character? Yes, I heard it. I heard a cut. Excellent. So we'll say cut. Then the dash D option says what delimiter we're going to use. We're going to use the colon to cut that. And then you can say dash F for which field. And remember, Python counts from zero. Lots of Unix commands don't. So we want to take the second field. So this would be our field number one. and. We Anything after that in the next group would be field number two. So we'll say dash F2. Try that. Press enter. So I'll give you a second. You want to run this command right here. So here we go. And that way the file names have disappeared. We're going to try that again, and we're going to collapse that into the unique set of entries. There's multiple ways to do this, but this is the way that I tend to do. I do a sort, and I give it the dash U for unique flag. So that's a U. And what we should get back is a list just of the unique types that were in there. You can see that whoever's putting this together is using slightly different forms of text. Something came back as an alias Maya image file, which is clearly misidentified, since I don't think we have any alias files in here. So you do, did you do an ls in that directory? You need to go into the enc root directory, cd into that directory, and then you should be with those files. If you look at my prompt up there, 
it says research tools at Ubuntu tilde slash class 17 slash and then ENT underscore roots. So you need to be in that same directory. While this isn't very interesting in this case, we're going to be working with more and more data types. So remember these kinds of commands to get yourself reoriented. There's nothing like getting a big blob of data from somebody and not knowing what's in there or what type of data it is. And this is a way to start out looking at that. So we're going to see a number of ways to work on data today. So let's go ahead and we're going to go into one of the New Hampshire charts. So let's go into US 5. I'm going to hit tab here to get a list. There's NH and we have 0, 1 and 0, 2. I'm going to pick randomly 1. So now if we do a PWD, or actually I'll do a clear. I'm not sure you guys have seen this command with me yet, but if, you, if your screen gets too crazy and you want to move back up to the top, type clear. It gets you up to the top, and we can do a PWD. So that was a clear. It's a good one to have up your sleeve. Sometimes when you're staring at a screen with just too much stuff, it gets a little crazy. So let's take a look at what's in here. And we've got a bunch of text files that talk about what's in here. This down here with the 000 is actually going to be our data. You need to do an LS and see what you've got in there. To hit control U, clear that line. Now type LS and see what you've got around. Now if you look through here, you need to pick one of these. So you're looking for the one, like this one right here is the one I went into. And so you need to go into that directory. So you were looking at my prompt. So we've had this a couple times, so I'm gonna go back over this really quick. When you're looking at my prompt up here, this is my username. Then, so it's username at, and then the, this is the host name. So all, this will be the same for all of you guys when you're in the virtual machine. So this is the host name, colon. This tilde means my home directory, slash class. This is a directory. 17 is a directory. ENC root is a directory, slash. And then this is the directory that we're actually in right here. Dollar sign, in this case, is the prompt. So it's the end of the information that tells you about where you are. And then this is where I start typing. So when you see this, if you want to know where I'm at, leave that dollar sign out of there. So that definitely is a little bit confusing. So if you put the dollar sign in and you're trying to get to where I'm at, you're going to have trouble if you include that dollar sign. And remember that tilde isn't an actual path called tilde. That's a reference to your home directory. So hopefully that helps. And I'll do a quick demonstration. So if we do, if I'm going to copy this, edit, copy, edit, paste. I'm going to do a control A to jump back to the beginning of that line. And I'm going to do an echo. If you remember, we use echo to try things out. So this is the actual path of where I'm at. So hopefully that gets you guys thinking back a little bit and work on path skills. It's important to be able to have a sense of where you're at and what's going on. And always remember, use PWD to see where you're at if it's confusing, and LS to see what's in your directory. So if you're trying to find something and it's not coming up, those are the two commands that you should use along with the echo to get yourself resorted. Take a deep breath when you get confused with Unix and try again, start with those guys. If we do file star, so on everything in there, we've got our helpful text that I'll let you guys read on your own since it's not very exciting. There's some chart information. These two files are our S57 chart. So in here, each chart starts off as .000 as the main file. Any other files in here that are the same name with dot and then an increment list of numbers those are chart updates. When the program reads a chart, it reads that first file and then it starts applying all the files after it and builds up the chart data set. And let's take a peek in there because it's useful. I always, I'm a big advocate of people jumping in and looking at the data, even if you don't understand it. There's actually a lot in there that you'll start to pick up if you're just brave and you look at it. It might be binary data, maybe means nothing, but give it a go. So less US five, so we're gonna, Go look it in our chart, and it's probably going to be kind of gross, and it's a lot gross. But in here, this is what's going on. And if you read through this, you start to learn to read through, like, this just looks like random numbers. They're probably important, but I don't know. Right here, ISO slash IEC 8211. That's actually the standard that's used to write S57 data. And that's how I figured out what format S57 really was built on. In here, there's a bunch of other stuff you could probably figure out a little bit about the chart. I'll leave that if you're bored. We're going to try and use tools that actually understand this rather than having to dig into it too much. You know, even if you didn't have any tools on your computer, 
you could start to read up on what is this format and what's in this file. So Q to quit. Let's go ahead and use a tool that actually knows about charts. So from GDAL, we have two programs we're going to use today, or two groups. We have OGR. These are the vector things, so like lines and points. You can call it ogre if you want. These, this handles lines, points, shapes, polygons, all that stuff that you might draw with a pen. And then we have the actual GDAL tools. So this is going to be your vector, and this is your raster data, or sort of image-like data. So we're going to be using right now for S57 the OGR tools. And we have the first program you're going to see is OGR info. If we hit enter, it'll give us a little bit of info. But we can say man OGR info. And you can read up on all the different options that it's got. And the key one we want to see first is dash dash formats. So Q OGR info dash dash formats. So this command right there. And I'm going to pass that to less since I think it's going to give me a lot of stuff. So pipe less and hit enter. And these are the formats. Some of them may be familiar to you. Some of them may sound like gibberish. If you know all of them, you can have my job and I'll happily sit down there and you can teach me about them because I don't know them all. For example, I have no idea what a BNA is. But there's all sorts of useful files that you may have run into. You may have heard of an Esri shape file. You might have heard of S57 just a few minutes ago. We have CSV for comma separated values. This is GPX is a format for GPSs. KML is the format from Google Earth. GeoJSON is a very handy internet format. GMT, I'm not sure which format from GMT that is. And then there's some databases and you can hit space and you'll see that there's quite a few formats supported by this tool, but it supports our S57 chart. So that means we don't need to know the mechanics of how to get into an S57 at the bytes. So we can say OGR info and our chart, so US50. Press enter and hopefully it says something useful. It's saying quite a bit. Right away it gives you a warning that's pretty important. The driver in the software doesn't support update, which means that 001 file isn't being read. Kind of a bummer. And then it goes through and it starts telling you about what's inside. And with a chart, if you think about a navigation chart, they have different layers that cover different types of data. Anybody know what a C-N-T-A-R-E might be? Caution. Awesome. <laughs> Caution area. There's all sorts of different areas. And if, you, if you've navigated a ship, if you're a mariner, you probably know most of these. Maybe ne not necessarily by that acronym, but there's buoy locations, there's bridges, there's soundings. There's all kinds of really useful information in there. And we can start to grab some of it. Terrence has a good library. Yes. However, you cannot script it. Not in this way, no. And it only runs on Windows. So if you want to have an automated process running on a server, you're going to have a bit of a hard time with the Keras one. It's not bad. It's just you're going to want to be using it by hand. And there's definitely some great tools out there by all sorts of different vendors. I think Esri's got a good reader. Keras has got a good reader. Hypac, lots of other companies will do that. But we're going to go through the command line style of things. So S57 is going to be going away, I bet you it'll take a decade or two before S57 really disappears. So let's try converting this to a couple different formats. Let's use the OGR to OGR command, and you can do a dash H for help, I believe. I'll show you a quick command since it, it's kind of overwhelming, but there's some quick, easy commands to do. Let's, let's try making a KML. So we can say OGR <coughs> to OGR, then you tell it the format out that you want with a dash F, so KML. This is where I always get it backwards. You say your output file, so us5.kml and us5.000 for your input. And go ahead and hit enter on this. We're, we're not going to open up Google Earth because it's not very good inside of the virtual machine. But afterwards, if you want to put that in like your Dropbox folder, you can load the KML in there and bring it up on a Mac or Windows or on a regular Linux box and view it. So hit enter. It'll go off and create a KML pretty quick. I've actually done a lot of visualizations that needed charts in the background. It needed the fairways and the traffic lanes. This is a great way to just grab them out and put them in the background of your data. 
So we can do a less star.kml, and we should see our KML pop up. Don't feel like you have to understand this, but then you can go in and start getting a sense of all these things that are being created in there for KML. And you'll see there's actually, here's some geometry. Here's a polygon defining some object inside of the chart. In this case, I think it's probably a bridge. Helpful, but not great. Let's try comma separated values. We've worked with that a be good. So let's go up to our old command. We're going to change KML to CSV and KML to CSV. And go ahead and hit enter on this. And you should see a whole lot of warnings and complaints. The CSV format doesn't have a lot of support for geometry. It's not going to work too well, but we'll take a peek. You didn't get any errors? Okay, so what you did is you actually made a KML. So you didn't you had to change both that and that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Make sure you change the after the dash F and also the extension on there's two spots. So if you didn't get an error message, you want to do both of those. Do the capitals matter? The capitals right here do matter, yes. What about in the others? Here is your choice. You can make the most hideous name you'd like right here and it will happily create something of whatever name you picked. So that the, um, new KML that I made, that's .csv, that's a KML, right? Yes. The great thing about extensions is you can make them whatever you want, and it might screw things up pretty good. That's the, then you can run the file command on it, and it might, you know, it'll tell you that you're not looking at what you thought you were, or you can use less. And you, when you start seeing things like KML in your CSV, it's going to be a little crazy. So let's do an ls-l in here to see what it created. Always good to go back to the basics. You guys notice that this is blue? Kind of surprising. You expected a CSV file, right? Uh, there's a D over here for directory. That's kind of odd. Yeah, you might need to delete the KML file or that CSV thingy first. So we have a directory. Let's go in there. So we'll go in CD into us5.csv. Now remember tab, the autocomplete, it often knows what you're doing, so if you have a CD up here, it's going to realize that you don't care about anything else in this directory other than this subdirectory. So CD into there, do an ls-l, and you should see a whole lot of junk. And let's take a look at one that might be interesting. For example, if you're doing a figure about Great Bay and you've got some data out there, you might want the shorelines. One way to get that is from the land area. Right here is land area, so maybe we can try and use that one. So we'll do less and then LND tab, area tab. Okay, there we go. Hit enter and take a peek inside of that file. So hit enter and here's what you're going to look at. I can't for the life of me see in here coordinates I can directly use. So I don't know what all of these things mean yet. I haven't looked them all up. I'm wondering if this could be encoded coordinates or it could be something else. You're going to have to count through here the number of commas and look through and say which one is it. And I think it's actually just an ID number of some sort. So it doesn't look like there's any good coordinates in here. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine. It's L name. So those are all empty in most of these. So not very helpful. Yep, you see some of the names down there? Those are good. But we don't have coordinates. So it's kind of hard to use spatial data without coordinates. So the CSV format is not something that we really want. It was a good idea, but nope. So let's use our GIS program, QGIS. Go up to Applications, and we're gonna, we've been doing so much command line and Python and whatnot. Let's go play with a GUI program for a bit. And remember, GUI means graphical user interface as opposed to like sticky and old and yucky. Yeah. <laughs> Go under science, quantum GIS, and start that up. And you'll see something probably like this taking over your entire screen. I'm going to make that cover less of the screen by clicking this right hand button. So what we want to do is we can add layers. And you can build up whole maps. It's very much like uh, arc maps and things like that. And we're going to go ahead and try and load up our land area. So do add vector layer. Pick that. And you should have a dialog up. 
and the browse over here will get you towards looking for the data set. I'm really, if anybody can just type in huge long paths correctly every time, I'm impressed. I guess you have paste in here. I'm typically using the browse when I do this. And you'll need to navigate to research tools, and then I'm going to go to class, class 17, ENC root. You can see it's building up the path up here, and we were in US NH1. You can see some of the files that we've created, but we really want that original chart data. When you get to here, press open. I've already done a step that I meant to tell you guys, and I forgot since I've done it. If you click down here, it typically it starts off like as reshape files, and you won't see anything else. I'm not sure why it does this. I don't like this. I like being able to see all the files. So make sure you select all files, and then pick your, hopefully then more stuff will show up. Where it was in front of these, it says OGR. Does that have anything similar to what we were doing before? Yeah, it's actually using, so QGIS is using GDAL to load that data. How did you get to the all files? I missed what Go down to here to this tab, and it should say something else like OGR something or other. Okay. Are you in, down here? See that guy? Click that tab, mm. and go down to all files at the very bottom. So you want to do add vector layer and browse. Then I would do it first, go to the tab where it says OGR KML and change that to all files at the very bottom. You need to do browse, click open if you get to that point, and then you'll have to click open again. And hopefully you'll see a map on your screen. Oh, yes, right. Many, many steps. So I'm going to click open. So we're on the US5NH01M.000. Click open. It's now going to show you that path in here is your data set. You're going to click open. And now it doesn't just open the entire chart. It wants to let you pick which layer you're going to look at. So we can scroll down to land area. So click 19 land area. This tells us I think that we've got like 67 little geometry features in there and click OK. And why does everybody have a different color? <laughs> hmm. These are things I didn't notice. Fun, fun. Well, lesson number one is you can pick whatever color you want. So for me, it's control click. For you, it's going to be right click on that land area layer. It's very similar to Illustrator or GIMP or any number of programs that does layers. And go to properties. And then since I don't really want my land hot pink, I might make it green. And then you click OK. And then you get to click OK again. And I have green land. You can pick brown land. OK, so that's loading up some geometry. Let's also load up the buoys. Point data is pretty handy to use if you've, say, got measurements out in the field. So we'll go View, Layer. We're going to add another vector layer. And now if we hit Browse, it's going to remember where you were. So if your data is all over the place, you're, you're still going to suffer trying to find things. But if you hit Browse, it should take you right back to where you were. So select the 000 file again, our S7 chart. Click Open and Open again. And now let's pick, I wrote it down because it's, I think it's one of the buoy ones, B-O-Y, 5 buoy lat. Does anybody know what the L-A-T part of buoy means? Lateral? OK. Click OK. And I'm going to make this screen bigger because that'll help. Did it crash? Uh-oh. Well, I'll have to catch up to you guys real quick. When you're doing that, there is uh, an info button that's like a little arrow with an eye next to it. Click that and try clicking on the buoys. And I'll try and catch up to you guys fast here. Layer, open, add vector layer. Browse, zero, open, open. All right, you get to see me do it again. And that was land area. OK, and now I have yet another color. Layer, add vector layer. Browse, pick my 000, open, open. So now I'm going to pick five, buoy lat, and I should be caught up to you guys. And now I have land and buoys. So if you haven't found it yet, there's lots of tools to help you out up here. And one of them should be right here, identify features. Click that, and it changes your cursor in here to be a little identify one. And you can click on the buoys, get the buoy ID, and get lots of information about the buoy that you're going to need to actually look up in the S57 standard if you want to know what 
all these things are for. Uh, in this case, like for this uh, DLC, we have also the upgraded file 0 0.01. Now we are looking at the upgraded chart or the old chart. So do you remember that error message we saw about not using the updated version? We're not using the updated version. So we're just using the 0, 0, 0 portion. If you want to pay the author of that code to add it, he will he'll be happy to add it. In this case, we already have that. The, the OGR tool, I don't think it knows how to read the 001, 002 files. I think we're out of luck <coughs> until Noah collapses all those features together into a whole new chart again at some point. And there's there are a lot of updates. Now we are looking at the very old ones. Yep, so we're kind of stuck. And the thing is, it's open source code. So the, the choices are we can complain about it, we can pay someone to fix it, or we can fix it ourselves or we can just unfortunately live with it. I think we'll stick with it, we'll just live with it category. So it's not perfect, but it gets us going. And if you need the chart update, then you can use like the Keras tool and get that going. For, but a lot of times, all you need is the basics. You know, a lot of times having the chart as just your background data is fantastic. You know, just knowing where the waterways are, where the buoys are generally, is what's going on. And then what you're doing is some data to go on top of that. And if you're actually building a nautical chart, you're probably using one of the very expensive tools like Keras to put together your chart. So if you do some infos, you'll see various buoys. Uh, you can zoom in and zoom out with uh, these guys. We can go zooming into sections. There's lots of other stuff that we can do with this. And hopefully, we'll be getting into more of it as we go throughout the whole semester. This tool can actually read absolutely huge data sets. And it can pull them in from big servers. And we can do all kinds of fancy stuff, a lot of which I haven't tried yet. So we'll be digging into it as we go. And I think now is a good time to switch over to our raster chart. So let's do a BSB. So I'm going to hide this guy. There is um, some ways that uh, the classical Arbitral chart visualization. If you want the S52 view, we do it with, we have some software here at CCOM that people have written that does it. No. S52 is, how do I put it nicely, a painful standard <laughs> to do visualizations with the traditional chart view. And everybody I've talked to who's written an S52 reader to read the, the symbology, they're usually pretty frustrated after doing that. It's doable, but it's not very fun. It's a, it's a very painful standard to work with. So in that case, if you really need the true chart symbology, you can try to import from someplace. You can go under properties and you can start picking symbology for things if you've got some an icon set. But typically, chart people don't use this this often. So this is like you, you're some of the first charting type people to really spend time with QGIS. So people tend to use it a little bit, but they use it a ton for other tasks. So it's not had a lot of exposure in the chart world. All right, so let's go down and I'm gonna search for BSB. So getting a raster chart. So we've just gone through the buoy lat and the land area, and we're gonna work on the get navigation chart. So now we get to go back to the Office of Coast Survey website, and we're gonna get the New Hampshire set of charts. Now with images, they're almost always bigger than your, in terms of file size. So we're gonna get 27 megabytes. But if we go back to, to Emacs, I've actually saved the link for you guys somewhere. We're going to go create ourselves a little space to put that in. So I'm going to go cd tilde slash class 17. So I'm going to do a clear. So in the link, if you search Control S in your Emacs window, just a click up here and do Control S and type BSB and then control A or something like that, or just go down with the arrow keys. And if you just click on like that link right there, that's a link right oh, to the, one. yep. That'll get you right to the raster charts. But I've actually got the link right to the zip that we need. The yeah, we're gonna use, so if you look right down below, there's a begin source sh, and we're gonna go through getting the files with wget. I'm gonna be in class 17. And I'm going to grab this link. If you want to go through that chart, you can. So I'm going to copy the wget and be lazy. So we're going to grab that zip. We're going to skip all those warnings. So you all promise not to navigate a 1,000-foot ship off of what we do today, right? OK, good. 
So that'll be under the getting a raster navigation chart section. And I'm in class 17, and I'm going to go ahead and do a get. It's going to take a little bit longer, being 27 megabytes. And we'll see if Silver Spring notices that they get a whole lot of chart downloads from CCOM to be get. Yep, you're going to want to probably move back up to class 17 first. So you can do like a control A. And then it, uh, yeah, I'll tell you a fun story in a second. Then hit a pound for a comment, and we'll save this command so you can run it again. So hit pound, uh, shift, it's shift and that. Okay, so now go back to your CD and see you're missing a slash between the tilde and the class. In fact, there's an iPhone app that uses the raster nautical charts from NOAA. The application isn't written all that well. It doesn't cache or save any of the charts locally. If you pan around, it re-gets the chart every time you come back to the area. So if someone's panning around like the whole US East Coast up and down a couple times, that means they've downloaded all the charts from NOAA like four or five times. I think it was 2009. All of a sudden, NOAA went, oh my goodness, like a third of our downloads of charts are from the iPhone. Because it can see which kind of application is downloading it and on what platform. And they were like, wow, the iPhone is super important to charting. Well, yeah, it's important, but we had a bad app that just kept downloading charts as fast as possible from NOAA. <laughs> Basically, what that meant is that NOAA needed to go find that author and say, can you please put some caches in your software so you don't keep downloading our charts all day long? So those metrics, doing metrics by sheer number of downloads is a dangerous, dangerous game. All right, so we have it. We have a zip file. If we remember from before, we can say unzip-l-v and our zip file to take a peek what's in there. RNC zip. So this is our unzip command that we're going to do. And in the notes, I also talk about, for this one too, because I like to beat a dead horse, doing MD5 sums and SHA 256s on the data. If you come back and do these notes again in a couple months, those numbers might change, meaning that NOAA updated the chart without any really way to tell from the files that they've gone and changed something other than the fact that the data is different. Sure, it's deep down in there. Yeah, yep. There, it's, it's also in a catalog file. Yeah. The catalog file is actually what we get into, but we don't we haven't covered XML yet. Uh, the MD5s I'm getting is different from the one catalog file per se. Oh fun. Let's take a quick peek. This is why MD5 sums are awesome, because then you you start going, what's happening? Okay. Okay, let's do an ls shell at that file. Let's take a peek. It would be my luck if they updated the chart like today. Oh, yeah. And then, so we're, then do the MD5 sum again for me. And it's definitely different. Let me try it and see what I get. Uh, is anyone else getting a different one? All right, let's see what happens. What do I get? Okay, <clears throat> interesting. Let me quick double check that we what I did before. MD5 sum, Dropbox, T class. Wouldn't that be my luck? It looks like Noah has updated that file between this morning and now. <laughs> Go Noah for an update. All right. So we'll do. Uh, we'll go back up and we'll run the unzip l v and hopefully what's in here is the same thing that I expected. And you should see a whole bunch of files that say .bsb and .kap. And the funny part about BSBs is the KAP file is actually the BSB file. So that's the actual image data is the KAP. So you might want to call this the KAP format. We just have to live with it because it's, it's old, crusty, and will be with us for a few more years. So let's go ahead and unzip that. Let's we'll start playing with some raster data because it is actually, I like the look of raster charts. They just look pretty nice other than the fact that they have Loran lines all over them that we don't use anymore, at least in our country. So we'll do unzip nh rnc, and it should say inflating, 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 and we have a whole bunch of files now. We can run uh, du-h on our nh rnc. If we do an ls-l, which is better to do first, you'll see there's a new directory called bsb root. Um, okay, so hit up arrow. Notice that you're doing the same dash L dash V, and it's yeah. doing it so fast that the screen is refreshing. Ah, okay. And that's a, a classic thing with Unix is when, when you've got a machine that's fast, 
and you rerun the same command, if that command fully wraps the screen, it may actually never look like the screen even changed, and your command just disappears and you get a new prompt. It actually means that you've run, it redrew the whole screen, and it was too fast for your eye to catch. Uh, so you're going to want to take off the dash L and the dash V. So the command to unzip is just unzip and the file name. So you can do a du dash H and BSB root, and you'll see that there's a bunch of directories. Unfortunately, unlike the S57s, I don't know how to interpret those numbers in terms of which chart that is without a chart map in front of me. And I didn't bring one today. I'm sure there's one. There's lots of them online, but I'm not going to go looking. We're just going to pick one at random. So we're going to skip. You can do the same file command. I'll do it really quick. So we'll just say file or find dot. Whoop. Let's go into the BSB root. Otherwise, we're going to look at lots more stuff than we intended to. So we're CD into there. Do a find <coughs> period. So find dot pipe xargs file. So that it takes each line from the find command and passes it over to file. Then we're going to say cut dash d colon dash f2. So that second field is going to have the name. And if I'm going too fast for you, just give it a go. If you don't get it, go back through the notes later on. Take your time typing it out, and you'll see that we did, we're doing the exact same thing as last time. And then sort dash u. Press Enter and hope that I typed it right. And what we get is. ASCII text, data, directories, and more ASCII text of a slightly different form. So not very interesting. Unfortunately, file doesn't know much about charts. So we got to work on that yet. So if we do an ls-l, we'll see our directories. And I'm going to look at which one I used before. So cd13274, ls-l. And we have one chart. But our chart has actually got five images in it, it looks like. So the KAPs are the image data. And the BSB is actually some metadata to go with it. And we're going to be brave. So let's take a look at this BSB. I'm going to do it a little bit different than the notes. So let's take a look at our BSB. So less 13274.bsb. Now this one has a little less of the like reversed uh, colored text. And hopefully, it's a little more readable. So it's got these three-letter codes and then some data after it. And if we look right here, CHT seems to be a code that tells us what looks like a chart name. Cape Ann to Hampton Harbor, side A left. That sounds pretty good. So I think CHT is probably the code for the chart name. So let's try and use that real quick. This is kind of the, the time when you look at a file format and you realize that you can actually do a lot with something that you don't know very much about. So if we say cd dot dot to go up one directory to our bb root, and let's say find dot, and then we're going to say xargs grep, and that was cht, is that right? Cht. And in the notes, I did it differently. I actually did grep cht star slash star dot bsb. They're similar in terms of finding files. So hit Enter. And that gives you, so we've done it here, and those are our answers. If you have a pile of charts sitting in a directory, it may be the whole US charts. It may not. You can go and use grep to go find out which charts you've got sitting on the computer. So hopefully that's a nice example of mixing and matching commands in the bash cell to start putting together some knowledge about what you've got. You know, for example, what if you're doing a project in your office and somebody gives you 10,000 charts from all over the world? It's going to be no fun to go hunting through it for what you need. You can start learning how to run write commands like this that will then help you dig through all that data really quickly. Because trying to know the, and remember these numbers is not very fun. OK, so let's go back in there. So CD13274. And I'm going to type clear again. And let's go ahead and try to take a peek at some of this data. Now, we used OGR for vector data, and GDAL is for raster data. So we're going to use a command called GDAL info. We can say, I hope, dash dash formats. And this has even more formats than the OGR side of things. So GDAL info dash dash formats lists all the formats that this tool knows how to read. And there are some really crazy formats in here. 
but I don't know what they are. If you get to use all these formats, I'll think that you're probably uh, pretty tired by the time you get through all that. We can say GDAL info, and then we can look at our chart. So I hit tab, and it lists all the files in here. And we have files one through five that we can type. So remember, I haven't hit enter yet. We'll just pick the first one. So here's the command we're going to run. Press enter, and GDAL is going to try and tell us something about that chart. Some of it is going to make a lot of sense, and some of it is going to make very little sense. And there's a lot of GCPs. OK, here we go. So there's the command we ran. It tells us that it's reading a BSB map tech. It tells us about the projection system. So there's all the projection info of this chart. GCPs are ground control points. So they're the points on the chart at known locations. They're at a particular pixel, and that pixel is a particular place in the world. And it helps you do reprojections of chart data. And there's a lot of them. And then it tells you a little bit more metadata down here. And then it's got some corner information in terms of the pixels. So we've now gotten a little bit of info about uh, BSB. And I'll leave it up to you to go off and read about BSBs if you want to. But let's convert one of those to a picture. We want to see if that chart is something we care about. And there's another GDAL command called GDAL translate that we can make. Let's just make it into a PNG. It, that's not a geospatial format, but we can definitely take a look at the picture. Dash OF is output format. And we can say PNG. We'll say 13274 underscore one dot KAP. So first, uh, so first comes our input. So this is the, the BSB KAP file. And then our output. So 13274 underscore one dot png. I'm going to double check that before I hit enter. And the program's going to go run off and it's going to make a picture for us. Let's do that for a couple of them. So I'll do it for two. So you need to replace two different numbers. There's one right here and there's one right here with the two. Press enter. Runs off and does that. Three and three. So that, that worked. Now we can say display star.png, or we actually, let's do an ls-l first. So now we have a couple PNG images running around in there. And we can use the image magic display <coughs> command to take a peek at them. So do display star.png and press enter. There's a little pan window in here. So it's display star period or full stop PNG. So then you can use the little pan window to drag around where you are on the chart. You can get nauseous looking at the screen. If you just click, you get an image magic window. You can say view half size, view half size, and you can zoom out in your chart. It doesn't do a very good job of zooming, so it looks pretty, pretty gross. But we now at least have a picture of our chart. We've seen it. And you can hit space to go to the next chart, I believe. or. And then it works really hard for a bit, and then you get the next chart, and you can go zoom around. Space again, get the last little bit. And what you can see is that one NOAA chart consists of a whole bunch of images, and here they store each of those little map insets as a separate KAP file. Otherwise, it'd be very hard to work with them because you'd have to have control points deep inside of another picture. So here you can see the Merrimack River, and then a queue to quit. All right, so let's try that in QGIS. So I have quantum GIS down here. So if you bring up QGIS, you can do File, New Project. And we're not going to save what we did, so close without saving on our last one. And we can go back up to Layers. And we did Add Vector Layer before. We're not going to do that. We're going to go down Add Raster Layer. So rasters are basically pictures. And I'm going to go back. Now, it seems to keep track of rasters and vectors differently, and it keeps the old path around. So if you have your rasters and vectors separated, it'll remember that. I'm going to go into class 17. And before we were in ENC root, now we're going to go into BSB root. And then 13274. So you go in there. And we're going to pick one. We'll do the first one, I guess. That seems good enough. And if you don't see anything, Remember to click that bottom link down here. The, if it, it might say something like, you know, uh, it probably will default to something like virtual raster, which won't mean anything to you. 
So click virtual raster, go down to the bottom, pick all other files, and then pick that one 13274 underscore one dot kap. Click open. Your computer works really hard and you have a chart. Now you probably at this point want to use the zoom in button so you can see something. And you can then zoom in to a region and keep zooming. And you are now looking at a chart. Is North not up on that? I haven't looked. This is the Merrimack River. I think it's actually pretty close. I think it may have be rotated so the North's up. So you think the North is, like, the chart shouldn't be rotated? Or should be rotated? No, the like chart should be rotated if you want to have North up. Okay, on this particular one? On that particular chart. Okay. I think because the coastline isn't directly North-South, they try to get as much coastline as possible with the space they have on the paper. Oh, okay. I haven't looked at the actual paper version of this. So you can also do um, file new project, close without saving, layer, add raster layer, and we can pick like number five or four. Yep. Oh, is it got the north? Where's the north yeah. point? North is actually up there. Oh, good. Yeah, so it has to be rotated to be north up. Okay, I think my computer's working hard on that number five. Oh, there it goes. So the virtual machines aren't necessarily the fastest. They don't have that much RAM for them. So they might actually have to work pretty hard to open a chart. It's really big. We should hang up here and we'll take a look at bags next time on Tuesday. And hopefully, if I can pull it together, I'll create a GDAL build that actually can read bags because it'd be nice to be able to actually see the data in the bag. Because there's, a, there's some fun ones in this area. We have one that's a LiDAR file and we have uh, some that are bathymetry. And we can take a peek at the metadata and see, I have the file from 2010, and we can see if the file actually now says the word LIDAR inside of it, which it didn't before. One of the things that, to know about some of these tools is that if you're looking at Keras and you're building a chart, you don't always, if you're exporting bags, the current interface doesn't let you type in very much. And so there's no way for the operator to create a complete correct metadata file for a bag from NOAA. So NGDC has to go in and use these same tools that we're using to rewrite the metadata to be correct after it gets to them. All right, guys.